We're excited to hear from Dr. Kazanjin and Kelly Ko Kobeck, APRN from the University of Miami, who will discuss the rationale behind their research that is pursuing deeper responses with linbocelfenab in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. A link to their study, Immunoplant for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma will be sent out in the follow-up email. And we chose today's topic because we like to stay on the cutting edge of research and treatment options. Keeping you informed about what is available by way of clinical trials and treatments is at the heart of everything we do. With that, I'll go ahead and introduce to today's speakers and then we'll turn the time over to them. Our first doc, uh, speaker, Dr. Kazanjin, clinical and translational Research interests lie in the treatment of precursor plasma cell disorders, including high-risk smoldering multiple myeloma and the role of immunotherapy in plasma cell dysphagia. In addition, he is reevaluating the role of autologous stem cell transplant in the area in the era of highly efficacious novel drugs, immunotherapy, biologic, cell-based therapies with a hypothesis that certain subsets of patients with myeloma may not benefit by default up front ASCT, all of which is at the heart of the research we'll discuss today. Kelly Kobeck is an advanced practice registered nurse in the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Currently, Kelly serves as a research advanced practice nurse at the Sylvester Myeloma Institute, specializing in plasma cell disorders. Beyond her clinical duties, Kelly actively contributes to the advancement of medical science by serving as a sub-investigator for interventional clinical trials, playing a crucial role in the implementation and development of research trials and facilitating the, the dissemination of clinical trial findings. Um, I will now turn the time over to our speakers. Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much, Cindy, for the kind introduction and for giving us the opportunity. Um, I think I wanted to, you know, make the community aware of this investigator-sponsored trial and, and any other sort of updates we may have here from Sylvester in, in, in South Florida. <clears throat> you know, just to kind of, I wanted to give a, a brief refresher. I'm sure, you know, a lot of the people listening on probably know this stuff just as well as we do, but just in case those may not be as versed or, um, you know, I'm sure there may be some new patients and new caregivers um, on this call. But as, as we know, it's newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. It's multiple myeloma that obviously is newly diagnosed and, and, and treatment hasn't been started. Um, the definitions of of multiple myeloma have changed, um, you know, about a half a decade ago, a little, actually almost a decade ago, um, to include not only what we typically think of the as the CRAP criteria, so those who don't know, the CRAP stands for, the C stands for hypercalcemia, the R stands for renal insufficiency, the A for anemia, and the B for bone destruction, but also to include what well, what we term as myeloma-defining events. And so these aren't necessarily end organ damage in themselves, but are so um, prognostically, are so predictive of patients developing organ damage up to 80% in a couple of years, that those patients have been kind of reclassified um, to the current definition of newly diagnosed myeloma. And those, those three myeloma-defining events include the percentage of bone marrow plasma cells being 60% or more, the serum-free light chain ratio being 100 or more, and having more than one focal lesion um, on MRI, which the type of MRI is typically a, either a diffusion-weighted whole body MRI or a full spinal um, series MRI. You know, just to get historically speaking, when it comes to treatments, um, as everyone knows, a couple of decades ago, it was very difficult. We had very minimally effective therapies that were very, you know, toxic. Um, kind of the introduction of, of the proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib and, and the immunomodulatory drugs, starting with thalidomide and lenalidomide, really kind of changed the landscape. But in parallel and around the same time, what was seen was um, 
one of the cytotoxic chemotherapies, an alkylating drug called melphalan, um, you know, portrayed like exquisite sensitivity in, in, in myeloma. Um, and higher dose patient, and then higher doses were associated with higher um, you know tumor destruction rates. But at very high doses, obviously it also kind of um, takes out normal cells too. And that's kind of how what we call high dose melphalan with autologous stem cell transport uh, uh, transplantation was 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 developed. Um, and the treatment was so effective and it, and it really changed the natural history of the disease back in the early 2000s that since then, a lot of everything else that came along was kind of modeled around that. So the way I think of it was that high dose melphalan and transplant was kind of the nucleus. And then as better therapies were being developed for the initial, what we call induction, well, it's probably better term combination therapies that everyone's heard of, was kind of based around that. And then on, on the other end, the maintenance therapies. But our initial therapies and our novel, novel therapies as I call them, have gotten so, so good. And they're not only so good in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of the side effects. Uh, nothing like cytotoxic chemotherapy. And so, you know, different groups, you know, approach this differently. Our group, for sure, and myself, um, we're always trying to challenge this paradigm about building all these therapies around high dose melphalan and stem cell rescue. So, um, you know, the immunoplant study that Kelly is going to speak about shortly is kind of kind of that idea to see if if some of these newer immunotherapies can potentially take the place of transplant, but at the same time, sort of keeping transplant available if you need to. So I think the field is, is somewhat divided into two currently, and there's two, way, two ways to approach this the autologous transplant. One is the older way, which is, you know, after a few cycles of combination therapy, everyone just gets a transplant, irrespective of, of the initial response. And then other groups like, like ourselves, we kind of try to maximize the, the effect or, or the benefit of those initial combination therapies. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, combination therapies, just to give you an analogy so we can put a name to it, things like, you know, VRD, DARA, VRD, KRD, those therapies. Um, and we typically, the paradigm has been, you know, you get about four cycles of those therapies and go on to early transplant. But as we all know, patients get deeper and deeper responses if you keep them on for longer than four cycles. And so we can kind of try to maximize that and most of our patients getting, you know, usually around eight to 10, even sometimes up to 12 cycles of the initial combination therapy. But what we do do early on after four cycles is get the stem cells collected and harvested and stored when available so that we always have that as an option so that it doesn't become challenging as challenging later to, to collect those, those stem cells. So some of the more recent studies, you know, this, how does transplant benefit patients. A lot of the early studies have shown a clear progression-free survival benefit. And for those who don't know, progression-free survival means, you know, the time it takes for the cancer to, to, to get worse or to die from the cancer. That's progression-free survival. And of course, overall survival, how long patients live. And the early studies that use transplant in the context of these older chemotherapies definitely shown an improvement almost all the time in progression-free survival and some of the time even in overall survival, which is kind of a hard metric to prove. Not because, it, because drugs can't do that, but because statistically it's, it's just difficult. Um, but when we kind of fast forward to more modern trials and that are evaluating transplant, what, what it does seem clear, and, and the best example is, um, you know, the use of VRD with and with that transplant um, that was presented by Dr. Richardson from the Dana-Farber. And what they showed is in this randomized study that those patients who did receive the early transplant, on average, this is the average, it took longer for the myeloma to get worse. So, the, so there was an improved progression-free survival. However, 
patients in both arms, whether they got transplanted or not, actually live just as long. And so that kind of, what does that say? That I'm not saying that you don't need transplant, but I'm saying maybe you don't need it early necessarily uh, up front. I think the other important, very important thing is the sort of, along with our medicines, the kind of constant improvement in our technologies to, to evaluate study treatment effect. So, you know, we started with the serum protein, electrophoresis and M proteins, and now we're talking about minimal, minimal residual disease, circulating tumor cells and DNA and mass spectrometry to evaluate disease. And one thing we know is when we use minimal residual disease at at least 10 to the minus five sensitivity, based on that study I was just talking about, is that those patients who attain MRD negativity don't seem to necessarily benefit um, from receiving transplant. So it's kind of like, if you can get to that MRD negativity, then it doesn't necessarily matter how you get there. Now there's different ways you can interpret, you know, the data, but this is sort of how, how we interpret it. Um, and of course, the next question is for those patients who do need autologous transplant, you know, what's kind of, what's in the horizon? What are the next steps? And so this study, the amino plant just sought out to address really the question is, can some of these new bispecific antibodies that have been doing so well in the relapse refractory kind of setting for patients, you know, who, who relatively have had, you know, been exposed to, to different therapies and, 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 you know, their immune system is not as fresh, so to speak, as, as patients who may have newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Can you maybe get an even, even better, you know, clinical benefit? Um, and, and could it be a reasonable alternative um, to transplant? And, and I just want to, I want to finish off just by saying, again, what I'm challenging here is not that transplant is good or bad, or we don't need it or we need it. But what I'm challenging is, in the, you know, whereas transplant in the early days was so good that everything was built around it as the nucleus, I'm challenging that paradigm and saying transplant is very good in select patients. I'm very happy to have that as a tool in my toolbox, but it's a tool just like everything else. And, and we, you know, reevaluate for the particular patient what tools we need to use. You know, you can't use the biggest hammer all the time if you're trying to put a screwdriver, a screw in sometimes if, if, if you could catch the analogy. So on that note, it's I'm, I'm very delighted, you know, to introduce, you know, Kelly. Well, she was introduced, but to hand it over to Kelly, She's, one of our, she's our outstanding um, research nurse practitioner and, and really has been seeing all these patients um, on the immuno plan and, and along with some of our other studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazanjian and Cynthia. I have, Cynthia, I don't know if you want to share, I have some slides I prepared. So I'm going to be talking, as Dr. Kazanjian mentioned, uh, for a little bit about the Immunoplant clinical trial, uh, just some of the details surrounding that. Uh, so this is a, a new trial that just opened here at the University of Miami about a, a month or two ago. It's very recently been opened. Uh, since that time, we've treated about four patients so far, and we have a couple of patients that are uh, waiting to begin treatment within the next couple of weeks. So it's definitely been something that we have had patients that have expressed interest and that have been eligible. So we've been uh, enrolling several patients since it opened. It is an investigator-initiated trial. Uh, Dr. Kazanjian is the principal investigator for this study. So this is the immunoplay, so just the full name of it. So we take, we talk about it by its nickname, so to speak, of immunoplant, but the full name is immunoconsolidation for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma using lack of MRD or minimal residual disease negativity after initial combination therapy to, produce, to pursue deeper responses with lymphoceltamab. So this is the drug that's used within the trial and delay transplant. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so just some general background. Uh, Dr. Kazanjian touched on this a little bit, but just to just to dive a little bit deeper into it. So this trial, you know, we know that approximately 30 to 50% of patients 
do not achieve that MRD negativity or that minimal residual disease negativity after initial combination therapy. So what this means is that for our newly diagnosed patients that are treated upfront with either, you know, the triplet or quadruplet regimens, VRD, DRD, KRD, some of the things that Dr. Kazanjian spoke about, um, there's, a, there's a significant portion of these patients that will still have some leftover myeloma cells or, or will have some will be considered MRD positive um, after that initial combination therapy. And we know, again, going back to what Dr. Kazanjian was saying, that patients that achieve MRD negativity typically do very well. Um, so often this is somewhat of a, a goal that patients want to achieve to, uh, to get that MRD status. So they may do very well with their initial therapy, but when we do a bone marrow biopsy, they still have some leftover plasma cells and leftover myeloma cells. So the typical approach for these patients uh, would be to, if they are considered transplant eligible, would be to offer them high-dose chemotherapy with melphalan, which is an old drug, as Dr. Kazanjian mentioned, that's been around for a long time. Um, it's very, uh, it's a very, it, it's an effective drug uh, when used in combination with, with stem cell transplant, but can be a very, a very toxic drug. So the typical approach uh, would be these patients that have leftover, you know, myeloma cells, we defer them to or refer them to our stem cell transplant team, and then they would have, they would receive high-dose chemotherapy in the inpatient setting, and they would get an autologous stem cell, meaning they, um, they would get their own stem cell, stem cells back as a rescue. And this is a treatment option that works. It, it works for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Um, it is, it is something that is effective, but what we know is that based on previous studies that patients that get transplant do not necessarily live longer when compared to those that do not have transplant. We also know that some patients are not eligible for transplant based on maybe their age or if they have other medical conditions. And we also know that transplant can be associated with significant toxicity. Um, all treatments you know, come with their, their side effects. Uh, with transplant is associated potentially with um, infections, there can be GI toxicities, uh, secondary malignancies, different things that, that, that can be associated with transplant itself. So it is an effective treatment option, but it doesn't come without its risks. For this option, sometimes it's not a, or for this reason, sometimes it's not an attractive option for patients. Um, additionally, some patients may not be transplant eligible based on what I said previously with age and, and other conditions. So the idea behind this trial is we're targeting these patients that are the, the 30 to 50% of patients that are MRD positive after initial induction therapy. We're tar and we're attempting to convert those patients from MRD positive to MRD negative by targeting the last remaining myeloma clones through the use of T-cell redirecting bispecific antibodies, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. So what we're attempting to do is, is essentially convert them from MRD positive to MRD negative using bispecific antibodies. Go to the next slide. So just a little bit more information about the treatment regimen itself. So the drug that we're using is a drug called Limboseltamab, um, which is not currently FDA approved, uh, but we expect that it will be approved uh, in the near future. This is a, a drug that's produced by the company Regeneron. And it is a bispecific antibody directed against BCMA and CD3 receptors. And what does that mean? So BCMA is a protein that's expressed on the surface of myeloma cells. So what this drug does is it targets that BCMA that's expressed on the myeloma cell, and it also engages the body's own T cells. The T cells are part of our body's immune cells and essentially brings the two together to help the immune cell attack and destroy the myeloma cell. So really what it is, is it's more like immune therapy than it is like traditional chemo therapy. Um, and the BCMA bispecific antibodies, there are uh, bispecifics that are approved for the treatment of multiple myeloma. So while this drug specifically is not approved in the current right now, uh, there are other drugs in this drug class that are approved for the treatment of myeloma. So we have, you may have heard of teclistamab and l -renatinab. These are both BCMA bispecific antibodies. So they're in the same drug class as limboseltamab. Um, these have both been approved in recent years, 2022 for teclistamab and 2023, I believe for l -renatinab. Um and these are both BCMA bispecifics. They're approved in the relapse refractory setting, meaning for myeloma patients that have tried and failed at least four prior lines of therapy. And then there's another bispecific antibody called telquitamab, which is also approved for multiple myeloma. This has a different target instead of BCMA, it targets GPRC5D, which is another protein expressed on the, on the surface of myeloma cells, but works in the same kind of way as, as these drugs. 
So again, and Dr. Gazanjian touched on this a little bit, um, these drugs, the drugs that are approved, these bispecifics that are approved for multiple myeloma, we've seen excellent results giving them. And right now where we're giving them is we're giving them in the relapse refractory setting. So we're giving them to patients that have had many prior lines of treatment. So often their immune system is not as robust as someone that has not had exposure to as many therapies. So the idea with this trial is, is we're essentially replacing transplant um, with giving this this bispecific antibody. We know these other bispecific antibodies work really well. We're giving it earlier to patients that are newly diagnosed, have only had initial combination therapy. So the idea is that maybe the immune system is, is somewhat uh, healthier in comparison to those relapse refractory patients. So when we've seen excellent results in that patient population, we expect to see those same excellent results with this patient population as well, again, with potentially healthier immune systems. So the drug itself, uh, lymphoseltamab, is given as an IV treatment. Uh, it is given in 28-day cycles, so four-week cycles. Uh, the trial um, is, is a total of uh, six cycles of treatment. So patients receive four cycles, then they have a bone marrow biopsy, and then they can get an additional two cycles, So which I'll get into in a second. Um, so the drug is given weekly as an IV treatment. Um, it's given weekly for cycles one, two, and three, and then every other week we're getting in cycle four. Um, similar to our other uh, bispecific antibodies, the first few doses of lymphoseltamab is given in the inpatient setting. And this is to monitor for a rare but potentially serious side effect called cytokine release syndrome that can occur with these types of, uh, of treatments. Again, it's rare that we see this, uh, but it is a potential, uh, potential side effect of these medications. So for safety purposes, inpatient monitoring is what's safest and best for our patients. And this aligns with what we do standard of care. For lymphoseltamab, uh, patients are also give what's called, given what's called step-up doses, meaning they're given uh, the first two doses are smaller doses, and then they get the full dose with that third treatment dose. And that also aligns with the way some of these other bispecific antibodies are given as well. The first three doses are given in the hospital setting, uh, again, to monitor for side effects. Uh, patients are admitted uh, for about 24 hours, and if they do okay and they have no, no side effects, then they're discharged home. And then after those three doses, if they do okay with all three of those, all subsequent doses are given in the outpatient setting. And again, this is out of an abundance of caution, uh, you know, in alignment with what we do standard of care to make sure we're doing what's safest. Um, one thing that we have, or uh, one protocol that we have at the University of Miami is that when we give our patients these medications, because we know that that Set that side effect, that cytokine release syndrome can happen. We pre-medicate our patients very, very well um, with medications that, that work to um, mitigate that risk so that we're not seeing those that cytokine release syndrome. And I can tell you anecdotally, um, the patients that we've treated uh, with this with this medication so far, and I believe I said we've treated three or four patients so far, no one has had um, you know, the cytokine release syndrome to any serious or any severity at all. So everyone has done really well um, thus far with the treatment regimen um, when giving those pre-medications. So the first three doses are given in the inpatient setting, and then all subsequent doses, again, are outpatient. Uh, it is given weekly, as I said, for cycles one, two, and three. Beginning in cycle four, it's given every other week. After cycle four, patients will have a bone marrow biopsy. And that what we're assessing at that time is to see if they've achieved MRD negativity, if they've converted from being MRD positive to now MRD negative. If they are MRD negative at that time, then they come off the trial and they go to maintenance therapy with lenalidomide or, or whatever the maintenance would be for them, depending on what their initial induction or combination therapy treatment was. If they are MRD positive still after four cycles and they have not converted to that MRD negativity, which is what we're hoping to achieve, then they will receive an additional two cycles of lenoseltamab. And then we'll have a bone marrow biopsy again after those additional two cycles. If at that time they are MRD negative, then the same as, as previous, they will come off the trial, they will receive maintenance therapy, and that will be it. Um, if they remain MRD positive after those six cycles of treatment, then Transplant can be considered as an option at this juncture as well, uh, depending on, you know, the patient and, and you know, the decision making alongside the physician. So again, this isn't removing transplant as, a, as an option for these patients. It's just offering them an alternative and they may not end up needing transplant, but if they do, transplant is still there, uh, you know, down the road if they need it. So this is not removing that as an option. It's just giving them, giving them a different option up front.
Next slide. Okay. So this is just uh, some basic inclusion and exclusion criteria. So all of our clinical trials have certain eligibility criteria for patients to be enrolled um, that all patients have to meet. This is just some of the key eligibility criteria for this trial. So all patients must be diagnosed with, uh, they must be newly diagnosed multiple myeloma per the International Myeloma Working Group criteria prior to induction therapy. So this is for patients that have only had that have been diagnosed and had initial induction therapy. It's not for patients that have had two, three, or four prior lines. Uh, they must have received either. So these are examples of what of what patients, uh, what the initial combination therapies look like for these patients. So VRD would be Velcade, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, or KRD, Kyprolis, uh, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, plus or minus daratumumab for transplant eligible patients or uh, DRD, daratumumab, revlimid, dexamethasone, or VRD, velcade, revlimid, dexamethasone for transplant ineligible, ineligible patients as their initial combination induction therapy. And they must have had at least four cycles of these initial combination therapies. So they can have had more than four cycles. They can have five, six, seven, eight, but they cannot have had um, you know, less than four cycles to be considered for this trial. And they must have attained a response of at least what we call a very good partial response in, in myeloma. This is based on um, the IMWG has, has response criteria that we use and we look at based on um, you know, how patients' numbers have decreased when they've been on treatment. So they must have achieved at least a very good partial response or better, but must remain minimal residual disease positive at a sensitivity of 10 to the minus five after at least four cycles of combination therapy. So again, these are patients that have done very well uh, with it, with initial induction therapy. It's not meant for patients that have not responded to it at all. It's patients that have had a good response, but still have some leftover myeloma cells um, left over that we want to target with this. And then no other prior systemic therapies are allowed other than these initial therapies that we talked about. The exception would be if uh, some of our patients have received extremely limited cycles of other induction therapies, maybe before going to VRD or KRD. So that would be a discussion we would look through and make sure if they met eligibility. But again, this is not meant for patients that have had two, three, four prior lines of therapy. And then, of course, no prior uh, patients that have had transplant, either autologous or allogeneic, and have had high-dose uh, malfilan or high-dose chemotherapy would not be considered um, would not be considered eligible for this trial. And then just to, I think this is my last slide, but just to summarize, so essentially the, you know, the immuno plan is really a novel approach for MRD positive patients, it aims to convert that uh, residual disease using limbociltumab. Um, it presents kind of another attractive option for patients. Um, you know, what we know now is that patients have more and more options. Like Dr. Gazanjian was saying, it used to be everything was built around transplant. And in the era of these novel therapies that we know work really, really well, we now have so many more options that we're able to offer our patients. So it's really a very exciting time. Um, and this is a great option for patients, you know, as an alternative or to delay transplant. It's great. Maybe we, Cindy, we can take some um, some questions. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Kelly and Dr. Kazanjan. Um, it was wonderful to hear about your exciting new research and um, different directions that everything is headed. So um, I'm just going to remind everyone that now is your time to ask those questions. Um, so just type them in the Q and A box if you've got a question and. We will just get started. So our first question is, why would this drug not be considered for patients who have already had a stem cell transplant? You want to take that, or Kelly, or you want me to? You're muted. Oh, sorry. I said you can go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. And, and the answer is, um, what it's you can it's not it's just that it, you know every trial is in a different space is testing the treatments in you know in different patient populations at different points in the myeloma journey and in this study we're, we're testing another hypothesis um as kelly mentioned when this drug gets approved just as 
just just similar to the other bi-specific T cell antibodies that are, are already approved, patients who've had transplant up front can still get this. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, our next question says, does a person have to travel to Florida to participate in this trial or can I participate at my local cancer center? Unfortunately, this is a, what we call an investigator initiated trial. And so that's because of, of its nature, it can only be done, um, you know, in the Miami um, vicinity, unfortunately. Perfect. I'll it's say one of the nice. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. I, one of the nice things about this trial is it is limited limited cycles of treatment. Um, you know, so you know, we do have patients that travel for some of our treatments. Um, it is only potentially four cycles if MRD negative after that time, so four months, but at max six cycles of uh, six months of treatment. So, you know, if someone was considering traveling or something, it, it would be you know time intensive in, in that sense. But it is it's not a trial that's you know built for two years of treatment or, or anything like that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question is: How effective has this drug been shown to be for high risk patients? Is that something that's been investigated currently? It in general, it has been shown to be effective. Um, I don't necessarily know that it's it's any more or less effective as 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 the other bispecific antibodies that are available, um, but it's definitely effective. Okay, perfect. I got um, some of the saying that, of course, this is such a great webinar. Very interested in learning if it's still possible to join this trial. Um, they have done VRD and are in very good partial response. Um, not interested in AS, ACST and this sounds perfect. Um, what's the best way to get in contact so that they can look about joining the trial itself? Well, that's that's great. Thank you. You know, we th we think that um, you know we think we thank, but we also listen to our patients. I've been to very many. You know, through, through my career, a lot of these kind of. Um, meetings with patients. And, and that's the one thing I think sometimes not every patient is really up for autologous transplant. And that's what we, that's another reason we wanted to have something like this available. I do want to state that it is, what we're studying is a very sort of niche population in, in sense that it's for patients, you know, who've had a very good partial response. So you have to have at least that, but not, you know, in a, MRD negative remission. Also, the timing matters a little bit, and um, the ideal timing is is you know is before any kind of maintenance therapy um, happens. So we'd be happy to evaluate you, um, but that is one of the sort of exclusions. Is is it's supposed to be done before any maintenance therapy is started? Um, and what's the best way to contact us? I don't know, Kelly. What do you think? I would say, I guess just by directly calling, I mean, we could provide contact information for our, um, you know, for our, we have a, 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 um, a patient navigator that helps coordinate when we have patients that come from, um, from outside facilities. Uh, so we can give you that contact information or we could provide that contact information, but they help to, you know, they get outside records and they kind of get everything teed up. So when you have your first appointment with our team, we have all the records we need. Um, and it's, you know, a, a, a useful visit, not coming in without any information. We have all the information and everything set up. So we have a, a patient navigator that, that helps with that. And she's oncology specific as well. And actually my Loma specific, she's very good. So we can provide that contact information. Yeah, we can provide that. We can also, also, you know, because sometimes these these are time sensitive. I mean, they're they're very quick. But I'm more than happy if you want to send if you want to share my email and they can uh, patients can I can help sort of make sure that that goes through. Okay, absolutely. And we, if you guys are comfortable, we can share the patient navigator information in our follow up email as well. So you'll get that within 48 hours. But I'll reach out directly to the patient that asked the question as well. So we can get you guys connected. So thank you for that. Um, my question is what type of side effects have you guys seen um, 
with Lynn both Belpinab. I would say with this drug, it is very early that we've we've been we've we we just treated our first patient about a month ago uh, or three weeks ago or so. So it's very early um, with this drug specifically. Uh, with the other, you know, we have experience treating with the other BCMA by specifics like teclistabab and and elrenatinab, which are in the same drug class. Um, you know, up front, there's that risk of like I said, that cytokine release syndrome that can happen with the initial dosing. Um, that's rare, but but is a potential ser potentially serious side effect. Again, not one that we see commonly. Um, long term side effects. One of the one of the more chronic side effects we see with these is risk of infection. Uh, myeloma patients in general are at higher risk of infection, uh, but we know that these these therapies can can also increase that risk to some extent. Um, we've gotten really good at managing those side effects, though. Um, you know, we give, you know, prophylactic medications when needed. Um, we can give, um, you know, we monitor a patient's immunoglobulin levels and can give what's called IVIG to boost immune system. So we've gotten really, really good at managing those side effects so that they don't turn into, you know, um, hospital admissions related to infection and things like that. Um, Dr. Kazanjian, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I agree. I think I, you know, it's completely anecdotal, so don't quote me, but, you know, I, I feel, um, I've used it a few times before, you know, um, outside of this study, and um, I think it's well tolerated, actually, and, and I'll just say it's at least as well, if not better tolerated than even some of the approved ones, uh, but just with this whole class effect, we're not seeing any sort of esoteric long-term side effects like we're seeing in CAR-T therapies, but but what we, um, I think the highest risk is really just infections. But as Kelly mentioned, we're, you just have to be at a place that aggressively monitors and does all the things to prophylax against, in, including um, intravenous immunoglobulins to prevent infections. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, the next question is, when it is approved, hopefully, um, will it be approved only for newly diagnosed? Um, or is this, and they asked if, is this study only for newly diagnosed? Yeah, it's, you know, this it gets confusing, Cindy, so I'm going to try to explain. You know, that in general, there's two different kinds of clinical trials that are conducted during drug development. One is the ones that most people think of, which are the company-sponsored or the industry-sponsored trials. Those are the studies that, you know, they start off small and then they get bigger. And then ultimately, many of them lead to a phase three study, a randomized phase three study, which the drug company uses to get the drug approved. But, uh, and that's like 90% of all trials, um, more or less. About 10% of trials are the ones when the actual academic doctor, so like Kelly and I, when we have a thought or an idea, or we're trying to sort of do an ex experiment kind of ourselves. And so it's this is one of those types of studies. It's, um, it's ones that we came up with. And then it's the other way around. We kind of beg the drug companies to give us, you know, the drugs for free and stuff so that we can conduct the trial. Um, it's not, these are not easy to set up. But they're in some ways they're even more rewarding because you're trying your own idea out, so to speak. Therefore, and I'm giving I'm giving that preface before answering the question because the question so this trial is just a small trial that is just in the portfolio for this drug, but not any of the major studies that is going to be used to get this drug approved. So on that note, when this drug does get approved, it's most likely going to be, the indication is actually going to be for a relapse refractory, not for newly diagnosed myeloma, just like the other bispecifics. Perfect. I liked your analogy earlier of using a hammer for us, you know, in 30 and yeah. through. So it's nice to have a lot more of these different tools available um, and hopefully earlier on when immune systems are stronger. So that's, that's wonderful. Right. Perfect. I got one more here. To, to comment, so thank you for the excellent explanation. So, so basically these patients are lucky for this exposure. 
That's wonderful. It's like good support Thank for you. the child. Thank you. Uh, all right, we'll give it just a few more moments. Um, and we got a lot of really great information, a lot for people to digest as they look at where they are in their own treatment, but um, we will make sure that we share ways to get in contact in the follow-up email and then um, get sure. you guys connected. Yeah, no, I mean, if anyone is around and interested, we, we kind of focus on investigator-sponsored studies at Sylvester, and we do have a few other ones coming. So we have similar studies for actually a higher risk population. It's kind of in the maintenance phase that's kind of being cooked up currently. We have, um, you know, we have the advanced study that Dr. Langren's the PI of that's testing, you know, KRD compared to daratumumab with KRD, which is almost finished enrollment, but we still have about a dozen spaces left. Um, and then though we'll we'll be having you know these bias specific studies in, in, in earlier and earlier lines of therapy. I love that. And that's aside from all the sort of company sponsored trials we have. So if if someone is around is very interested, but they don't meet to, for a clinical trial, but they don't meet the criteria for this study, there may be another good study that's available. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we've got a lot of that information available on Health True through the Clinical Trial Finder. Right. Um, so we'll make sure people have access to that as well. Um, I did have one last question because I, of course, I've got the uh, IRMA study on my mind right now. And I'm wondering, as we get more information about patient genetics and different things like that, um, do we think that things like this will become more available, will be more tailored treatment options so that we're not just going down the same road with every patient. Yeah, I think, I think, I think absolutely. I think it's an iterative process. And that's why this, this is a very niche because the idea is, you know, a patient who has a very good partial response means that, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's a very good response as Kelly said, but we plan on studying not just treating our patients, but studying their samples for that leftover, very residual disease and to figure out, you know, what, what is special about it and, and if the immunotherapy, if it's sensitive to immunotherapy or not. And we'll be doing that by studying the underlying genomics and it'll ultimately sort of be all integrated into, you know, trying to get closer to a precision style medicine. <clears throat> I love it. All right. I think that's all the questions we've got. Of course, praise for the presentation. So thanks again for sharing your time today, Kelly and Dr. Kazanjian. Sure, anytime. Um, thank you for having us. Sure. Of course. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for everyone that, um, that joined. Perfect. Yep. I'll just go ahead and share my screen again. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so... Um, wanted to make everyone aware of our new uh, bi-specific antibody guide that we have available on Health Treat Care Hub. Um, so this guide simplifies the science behind bi-specific antibodies, a cutting edge therapy, which you've heard about today, of course. It provides a clear overview of how bi-specific T-cell engagers work, their potential benefits, and the latest advances in research with practical details on administration, side effects, and the comparisons to traditional treatments. This guide empowers myeloma patients and their care partners to make informed decisions about their treatment journey. As you leave the session today, we would appreciate you taking the two to three minutes to fill out a brief survey about your experience during today's, to today's event. Here are just a few of our upcoming events on Wednesday, October 9th, of course, we'll be talking about the IRMA study, how personalized is multiple myeloma treatment and how is that changing? Uh, Wednesday, October 9th, we'll also have a Spanish-speaking myeloma group uh, presentation, which is about the role of maintenance treatment. And then November 5th, we'll have a webinar about estate and legacy planning for blood cancer patients. We have many more virtual and in-person events in the works, so stay tuned. The link to sign up for any of these events and many others is found at the bottom of the slide and will be sent out in the follow-up email within 48 hours of the event completion.
I would like to again thank our sponsors, Adaptive, Abby, Genentech, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Regeneron, and Sanofi. Before we go, I wanted to highlight the Track My Disease feature in Health Tree Care Hub. Once you've connected your medical records, the Track My Disease feature provides you with the ability to gain one-of-a-kind access to your health information, encompassing lab results, genetic profiles, and treatment histories, offering you invaluable insights into your own medical journey. On the screen, I have a link to sign up for Health Tree Cure Hub, along with the email address for amazing patient navigators who are available to help you create an account and connect your records. I'll also include this information in the follow-up email. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you again to our speakers for their presentation and this wonderful information they shared, and to all of you for helping to build a strong multiple myeloma community. I've added my email to this slide, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about Health Tree or any of our programs. I appreciate all of you and hope you have a great rest of your day and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.